colonel had resolved to replace Gowan, they were not independently powerful enough to drive through their ideas and depose Gowan without the support of senior officers. To attempt Gowan removal without senior officer support would lead to bloodshed. To succeed, the plot required the support of senior officers directly below the generals in the SMC. These intermediate level of officers, mostly brigadiers, were the men who could turn the colonel's ideas into reality and included Brigadier Danjuma, Martin Adamu, Ilya Bisala, Gibson Jalu, and Ibrahim Aruna. The passivity of the brigadiers during their operation would be essential to removing Gowon. Colonel Joe Gaba and Lieutenant Colonel Shewu Yaradwa operated as the link between the colonels and the senior officer echelon. Brigadier Motola Mohamed was the most charismatic northern officer in the Nigerian army then. It would be impossible to stage a coup and to govern without his consent given the loyal following he had in the army. Gaba and Yaradwa went to Motola's Lagos house at number 6 2nd Avenue in Ikoyi to ask for his cooperation. When they arrived, they found Motola characteristically sitting under the almond tree in his compound. He was listening to an audio cassette tape of Quranic verses while reciting the verses contemporaneously. According to Gaba, Motola barely acknowledged their presence continued reciting Quranic verses without interruption. Gaba and Yaradwa waited sheepishly in silence for over half an hour until the tape finished. When the tape finished, Yaradwa finally spoke as he was closer to Motola than Gaba was. Yaradwa did most of the talking and he laid out their case against Gowon by accusing him of misrule and explaining that Gowon's regime was tarnishing the military's prestige. Therefore, the colonels had decided to depose Gowon and replace him with Mortola. Gaba said he added a few words for amplification after pondering over what he just heard. Mortola reiterated his usual contempt for Gowon and agreed that Gowon's overthrow was long overdue. However, after witnessing two bloody military coup and taking part in the even bloodier civil war, he was not prepared to take up arms for Nigeria again, although he agreed with Colonel's aims. Mortola refused to physically take part in the coup and limited himself to give a moral blessing to it and promising to do everything to defend them and save their lives should the planned coup fail. Motola then reinserted the tape and went back to his Quranic recitation. Gaba and Yaradwa departed with Yaradwa telling Gaba not to worry as he would find a way to talk to Motola around. Colonel Anthony Ochefu approached the GOC of the 3rd Division Brigadier T.Y. Danjuma and elicited a pledge of passive assistance from him. While Ochefu was at Danjuma's house, Colonel Gaba called and told Danjuma, Sir, we do not need your help. All that we need is for you to do nothing. Assurances of passive assistance or friendly neutrality were also obtained from Brigadier Bisala and Jalu and from the other GOCs. On the eve of the coup, Colonel Abdullahi Mohammed separately informed Brigadier Obasanjo and Colonel Bali that a coup would occur overnight. Obasanjo asked Mohammed to avoid bloodshed. After his conversation with Mohammed, Obasanjo traveled to the home of MD Yusuf to alert him. Yusuf appeared unsurprised and simply informed Obasanjo that his men would conduct extra surveillance that night. 
The plot also leaked to SK Dimka, a senior officer that was the older brother to Lieutenant Colonel Dimka of the Army's Physical Training Corps. Overnight, Colonel Ochefu and Lieutenant Colonel Yaradua also approached Brigadier Martin Adamu at his house and asked him to read their cool speech, announcing Go One's overthrow. However, Adamu was less cooperative than the other brigadiers. Nine years earlier, he had nominated Go One to become head of state and remained loyal to him. He refused to read the speech, still in his pajamas. Adamu pleaded that Gowon should be given another chance and bloodshed avoided. He was reminded that his refusal to play ball might lead to bloodshed. Although Gowon's absence from Nigeria saved Gaba the embarrassment of having to arrest him or arm him, there was a last minute scare for the plotters when Gowon's ADC Colonel William Wabi unexpectedly returned to Nigeria from Uganda ostensibly to collect a file that Gowon had inadvertently left behind. News of Wabe's return spooked the plotters and they feared their plot had been uncovered. Wabe was asked to come to Gaba's house. When Wabe arrived, he was astonished to see Colonel Anthony Ochefu. He knew that Gaba and Ochefu usually could not stand the sight of each other. Gaba and Chefu did not believe Wabe's innocuous explanation and thought he had been sent back by Gowan to keep tabs on them. Ochefu informed Wabe that it would be unwise for him to return to Uganda and that his colleagues were unhappy with him for being overly loyal to Gowan. Wabe became suspicious and told them to count him out of whatever they were up to. In the early hours of July 29, 1975, the core officers in the coup, such as Lieutenant Colonel Yaradwa, Abdullahi Mohammed, Ibrahim Taiwo, Babangida Buhari, Mokhtar Mohammed, Alfred Adulojo, Paul Tafa, and Sani Bello, met at the headquarters of the Lagos Garrison Organization to confirm each officer's operational order for the coup. Wabe joined them in the mess to discover that of those he expected to see, only Ochefu was present. He had simply been taken to the mess in order to isolate and keep tab. He would not cause any problem for the plotters. When Wabe arrived, he was greeted with sarcastic salutations of Welcome, Your Excellency. Welcome, Deputy Head of State. Welcome, Acting Head of State. Exactly nine years to the day after Wabe and other junior Northern soldiers led Major General Agui Ronsi and Lieutenant Colonel Fajui into a bush alongside Iwo Road outside Ibadan and murdered them. Wabe discovered that coup plotting can be a double edged sword. By 2 a.m., soldiers surrounded the Lagos airport, sealed off all approach routes to it, and suspended all Nigeria Airways flights. External communications were also severed. While Gowon was still in Uganda, he was overthrown in a military coup announced by Colonel Joseph Gaba. Speaking with a tense and emotional voice, Gaba announced in a dawn broadcast that Gowon had been overthrown in a bloodless coup without any physical casualties. Joseph Gumwalk Military Governor of Benue Plateau State called Bigreda Danjuma to ask him what he would do about Gaba announcement. Danjuma replied that he would not do anything to resist the coup and advised Gumwalk to go to a safe house if he was worried for his safety. The period of time during which a military coup is active is among the most tense and dangerous professional moments of a military officer's life. This is especially the case of officers not involved in or who are ambivalent to the coup. If an officer goes by the book and attempts to stop the coup, he could be killed in the process of doing so, or even if he survives, may be unceremoniously dismissed by the new regime if the coup succeeds. Conversely, if the officer cooperates with the coup plotters, 
but the coup fails. He could later be dismissed and or executed for supporting a mutiny. Military coups subject bystander officers to gut-wrenching life and death decisions in which they must ensure that they back the right horse. Backing the wrong horse could result in death. One officer faced with such a dilemma was Colonel Domkat Bali, who was temporarily commanding the two division in Ibadan. In the absence of his substantive commander, Brigadier James Ululei, Bali and his officers resolved to avoid bloodshed by assenting to the coup rather than risk an escalation by fighting against it. After receiving a telephone call from Colonel Gaba to ascertain his disposition to the coup, Bali ordered broadcasting facilities in Abaddon to interrupt normal programming and play martial music. He also briefed, then ordered that Brigadier Rotimi, military governor of Western State, be placed under house arrest. Bali's corporation may have been influenced by the fact that he is of Tarok ethnicity like Gaba and also hails from Gaba's hometown of Langtang. In July 1975, most officers in the upper echelon of the Nigerian army backed the right horse. There seems to have been an unconscious consensus among key unit commanders to avoid bloodshed by declining to resist the coup. Several officers decided that it was better to let the coup succeed rather than risk mass bloodshed by resisting it. Only one prominent commander attempted to resist the coup, but his action came too late. He was severely reprimanded by the plotters but was spared. Gaba was executed into the plot and choosing to read the coup speech for strategic reasons. As the commander of Gowon's personal security unit, the brigade of guards, the sound of his voice as the coup announcer would have a placating effect on Gowon's other security officers who would be unlikely to resist the coup and would assume it was an inside job if their commander was part of the plot. Major John Shagaya was a member of the Brigade of Guards in command of two guards battalion. Resistance by the Brigade of Guards could be dangerous as Gaba had personally trained and recruited a company of Gowon's Angers King's men into the Brigade of Guards to protect Gowon. The special company of Angers Guards was led by MacDonald Gotip. Gaba's command of the brigades of guards and initiate knowledge of Gowon's routine and security apparatus can be seen as parallel to the way the January 1966 majors used Gaba predecessor Major Don Okafor as Okafor was familiar with the Prime Minister Balewa's routine and domestic security arrangements. July 29th was the ninth anniversary of the bloody revenge coup that had brought Gowon to power and was chosen as the date for the latest coup. Precisely for that reason, the plotters reasoned that it was the last day that anyone would expect a coup, once again providing that coup plotting in Nigeria is addictive. Many of the same officers that participated in the coup that brought Gowon to power were also instrumental in the coup that removed him and in subsequent coups. News of the coup filtered back to the OAU conference in Uganda. Uganda's eccentric leader, Idi Amin, broke the news to Gowon. After brushing Amin off, Gowon took a seat in the conference hall and listened to a speech by the Director General of UNESCO. Dr. Amodu Mahta Mbo Mbo. During Mbo's speech, Gowon turned to Usman Farouk, the military governor of the Northwest State, and whispered in Aousa, what we have always feared has happened. When Mbo concluded his speech, President Amodu Ahijo of Cameroon approached Gowon and offered his sympathy. Gowon reconciled himself to the new reality and was his typically conciliatory self. 
The bloodless nature of the coup was partly due to his refusal to resist it. He wished the new leaders well. Gowon declined to answer questions from the press but joked, We will next meet as private citizen Gowon. He also quoted a few lines from William Shakespeare, as you like it. All the world is a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Gowon traveled to England and enrolled for a course in political science at Warwick University. The lack of bitterness between the new and past leaders even led some to suspect that Gowon's overthrow was a clearly orchestrated transfer of power from senior to middle grade officers. Such perceptions were given credence by the fact that Gowon's wife and children and chief of staff, Army Major General David Edjo, all left for London just before the coup and were conveniently overseas while it was executed. Edjo was quick to pledge his loyalty to the new regime. Gowon's brother, Captain Isaiah Gowon, was also in London, having just completed an artillery course. The brigadier Motola Mohamed had been informed of the details and timing of the coup and he too was in London when events took their course. The plane carrying him back was the only plane that was permitted to land in Nigeria that day. However, the drama was not over. Colonel M.I. Ushishi called a meeting of senior officers, GOC and brigade commanders at Dodan Barracks on the evening of July 29. Colonels had already decided that three of the superior officers, Brigadier Motola Mohamed, Olusegun Nobasanjo, and Theophilus Danjuma, would form a troika at the head of the new regime, with Motola replacing Gowon as head of state. Motola, Danjuma, and Nobasanjo were called into a separate room by Lieutenant Colonels Gaba, Yaradwa, and Abdullahi Mohamed. The three brigadiers were informed that decisions of the new SMC would only be taken with the concurrence of a majority of its members and that any decision that was opposed by two-thirds of the SMC could not be implemented. Motala angrily objected and insisted that as head of state, he should be given a free hand to govern unrestricted by his colleagues. The colonels warned him that they could easily nominate someone else if he did not agree, but Motala continued to argue and remonstrate with them and screamed, To hell with all of you, according to Gaba. Twenty minutes later, he was still arguing. At this point, Gaba became frustrated. He had been awake for 48 straight hours in a state of anxiety, heightened tension, and mental preparedness. The commander of the LGO, Brigadier Godwin Ali, came in to ask if everything was alright. He noted that the other officers waiting outside in an adjacent room were becoming restless and might live in frustration. The normally taciturn intelligence officer, Colonel Abdullahi Mohamed, also tried to persuade Motola and pointed out that Motola had a large army following who might wonder why he had been passed over. If they offered the position of head of state to someone else, they would leak the outcome of their discussions with Motola and let the public know the conditions he had refused. Motola exploded again and began screaming, This is blackmail. I am not going to have you blackmail me. Despite his ostensible anger and reluctance, the colonels could tell that they had got their men and that his resistance was softening even if Motala had to have a further theatrical outburst to show he would not go down without a fight. After some calming words from Danjuma and Obasanjo, Motala agreed to the colonel's proposal. However, in typically forthright manner, Motala told the colonels that once he assumed power, he would not allow himself to be a stooge of or be dictated to by the officers who had got him there. 
Motola made it clear that he would be independent and would govern as he saw fit. The meeting at Dodan Barak did not end till 4 a.m. So guys, thank you for watching. See you guys next time. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more updates and more information on Nigerian history. See you guys next time.